The game is a big deal. And it will cost you everything. The risk is great, but the payoff even greater. What happens when a group of people put it all on the line and boldly go? New Spring. Yeah, New Spring, how we doing? All of our campuses. I want to say hello to all of our campuses today, man. If you're in, and uh, listen, listen, let me, let me stop. Celebrate Christmas. Christmas was insane. Do you know we had almost, between all of our campuses, almost 27,000 people show up to a Christmas service and, and over 300 gave their lives to Christ that we know of. And so that we're going to celebrate that. That's not even including what happened online. We don't know how many, I don't know how many people, they probably know because they're techie people, they know everything, they're taking over the world, but I don't know how many people watched online. I do know this, I had people hit me up on Twitter all throughout um, saying, hey, um, my friend and I watched in a coffee shop tonight uh, and my friend gave her life to Christ watching online. So that, man, I'm just so excited about what's happening on all of our campuses um, and, and seriously want to welcome Greenville, um, Florence, Columbia, Charleston. Charleston is a year old today. New Spring Church. We launched Charleston a year ago today. So happy birthday, Charleston. And, and seriously, this year, this year, we're going to launch Myrtle Beach. We're going to be launching um, Greenwood. We're going to be launching Spartanburg. We're going to be launching Bora Bora. We're going to be launching, I mean, listen, those people need Jesus, and I need to go there and reach them. So anyway, we're so glad. If you brought a Bible with you today, I want you to grab it and go to the Gospel of Mark. Matthew, Mark, um, it's, uh, it's easy to find. It's right there in the New Testament. Mark chapter 12. And we're going to be talking about this concept um, today and for the next f- uh, four weeks after called All In. All In. And to kind of set this up, I want to kind of talk about New Year's resolutions. And most of, I'm not going to ask you how many made them because most of you wouldn't raise your hand because it's like January 8th and so you've already, you're falling off the wagon. But one, like all, there's all kinds of New Year's resolutions and some people make the resolution to, um, some of the most popular are to stop smoking. Um, I, don't, I was just telling you, it, it won't send you to hell. Like I always say, it just makes you smell like you've been there. Um, uh, some people, it's uh, a lot of people, it's lose weight. And, you know, it's New Year's resolution to lose weight. But, man, that wing buffet yesterday looked good, didn't it? So it's, that one's over. Um, but if, if, if you're a gym person, like if you go to the gym, you enjoy working out, you go to the gym, you've noticed that there's a new crowd of people in there this week, ha- haven't you? They're, they're the New Year's newbies, and, and they're, they're kind of around, and, and they're kind of getting your way a little bit. And they wear, they're wearing Under Armour, and some of them shouldn't. And, and anyway, so you, it's not politically correct, but listen to me. It's true. God help them. So anyway, they're, they're in your way and stuff. But, but give them time because they're not going to stay. And, and they'll be gone. And in fact, not just the end of February, I mean, end of January, they'll be gone. But reality is this, and this is, listen, it's a very politically incorrect statement, but it's a very true statement. In a gym, you can tell who knows what they're doing and who doesn't know what they're doing simply because of their appearance. Can you not? Can you not? Yes, nod your head. I'm not sure. Listen, it's true. The gym has certain people that show up every week. They have, um, they have the person that doesn't know what they're doing. They have the person that, um, there's always a guy in every gym that all he does is bench press and bicep curls. That's all he does every week, just bench press and bicep curls. There's um, the person that, that can talk on the treadmill while they're on their cell phone, uh, usually a woman, because um, men should be shot on the spot for that. Um, there is... Um, there is the person that's been coming to the gym for 20 years, but they look the same. You know what I'm talking about? Because they don't work out. They just walk around and talk to everybody, and they tell everybody, I was in the gym for two and a half hours, but they didn't work out. Um, and then there's the person that actually looks like they know what they're doing. And you can tell the person because they're, they're fit. They're physically fit. Like, they're, they're a little ripped up. Like, they wear Under Armour, and it looks good. Like, if I could look like that, I would preach in Under Armour. You know what I'm saying? Like, welcome to New Spring. But I don't, so you would throw up. So one of the things I've started doing, um, in fact, I started doing this years ago, was if I see someone that they are at a place where I want to be, I, start, I, I just kind of approach them and start asking them questions. 
Uh, if I see somebody that's got a very godly marriage, one of the things I've done, even before I got married, is I set up an appointment with them. I would take the dude out to lunch or dinner, and I'd say, listen, man, you're, you're uh, obviously a great husband. You've been married for a long time. Tell me some things to do or tell me some of the mistakes you've made, and I, I take notes. I still do that to this day. Um, if I see somebody that's a really great leader, um, I don't care what denomination they're in or whatever, I make it a point to go sit down with them and say, hey, listen, you're obviously a great leader. You've obviously learned some things. You've obviously done some things right. What are some things that you've done um, that help you to become a greater leader? And one of the things I've done, if I see somebody that's in great physical shape, that is a value that I personally have. I, uh, many of you know my story. I've struggled with weight all my life. And so I, I, I'll approach them and I ask them this question, what is it that you're doing? Like what, what, what workout are you? are you on? What are you doing? What kind of diet are you on? Because you're obviously in great physical shape. Now, here's the deal. I've never had anyone look at me when I asked them that question. Hey, you're in great physical shape. What are you doing? And they look back at me and go, man, I don't, I don't know. You look great. Why, why do you look so Well, I don't, I don't know. I, 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 was, I, was kind of, I was kind of out of shape and I got in the shower one day and I took a shower and I got out and I, was, I had abs. Because because if that happened, I would be like, can I come to your house and take a shower? Uh, like, not with you, but like, like can, can, I, can I do that like that? Because that's never happened. I never had anybody go, man, I don't know. I, I stopped by a convenience store one day and started eating Reese's. And uh, the more Reese's I eat, the, more, the bigger my biceps get. Because I would be like, that's not a bad plan right there, pass me the Reese's. Everybody that I've ever talked to that, that looked really great had a plan. It wasn't, listen, it went beyond desire. It actually stepped over into discipline. You know what I'm saying? Like anybody can have the desire to do something. It's the discipline to follow up with the desire that makes the difference. And so uh, I, th th that's, how, that's how I lost um, almost 85 pounds. It's, it wasn't desire. It was I got up out of bed and went for a run. And I ran two feet, and, you know, the first day. And then I ran four feet the next. I mean, it was, it was discipline. And, and that's so true. And we all know that to be true when it comes to people being in shape physically. Now, transfer that. To spiritual growth, and we'll talk more about this especially in two weeks, but Christians, many times in the church, we love to spiritualize everything. But let me tell you, there's some things when it comes to spiritual growth that you cannot pray yourself into or you cannot pray yourself out of. It's actually going to take discipline, spiritual discipline, to make certain things happen. And here's what I want for you. Here's what I want for every person attending every campus at New Spring Church. And if you're watching online, welcome. Glad you're watching online with us today. Here's what I want for every one of you, okay? It, it, this is a church where we don't want anything from you. I want something for you. I want for 2012 to be the greatest year of spiritual growth in your life. I don't care if you've been a Christian for four weeks or 40 years. I want, as your pastor... For 2012 to be the year that at the end of this year, you look back on it and you go, I walked with Jesus closer in 2012 than I've ever walked with him before. I know Christ more than I, th at the end of this year than I've ever known him. I want that for you so bad. And listen, I want it for me too. I want this to be the year that I grow more spiritually than I've ever grown in my life. I want that for you so bad. But listen to me. It's not going to happen just because we desire it. It's going to happen because we have the discipline to make it happen. Listen, 2011 is gone. It's over. And listen, 2011 could have completely sucked for you. And if it did, I'm really sorry. But you can either play the victim card for the rest of your life, or you can step in the victory that Jesus has for you. You cannot do both. So it's time. Listen, there are too many victims in America, especially in the church. Listen, I know what 2011 might have been brutal. Stop being a victim. Let's step into 2012 and live in the victory that Jesus promises us because he promises us victory. So let's do that. 2012 or 2011 could have been the greatest year of spiritual growth you had in your life. 2011 for me personally was a great year. But 2012, I want it to be better. But it's going to get better, and it's going to get better for all of us if we understand this. It's, the same, it's true physically, and it's true spiritually as well. In fact, if you have an outline, I want you to write this down. A growing relationship with Jesus is intentional, not accidental. A growing relationship with Jesus is intentional, not accidental. So, everybody listen. Everybody listen. If you want to be godlier this year, it's not going to happen by accident. You're not going to trip and fall and step, stand up and go, I think, I'm, I think I'm godlier now. 
If you want to grow, now listen, listen, listen. This has nothing to do with receiving God's love, okay? God loves you, period. God loves you whether you read your Bible or not. That doesn't matter. If you want to grow personally in your walk with Christ, it's not going to happen by accident. It's going to happen on purpose. And Jesus talked about this. Now, Jesus, if, if you've never read the Gospels, I would encourage you this year just to read the book of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. I've had people say, I can't read the whole Bible. Listen, d- then don't try. Just read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. You can just, re- just read through those. Matthew has 28 chapters. Mark has 16. Luke has 24. John has 21. A chapter a day, you get it from like four or five months. pretty easy. But just, I would challenge you to just read through it. Now, the thing that's fascinating is it's all about Jesus. And you'll find some things happening in the Gospels that are quite interesting because one of the things you find is the religious leaders didn't really like Jesus that much. In fact, he was always hanging out with the people. They were like, why are you hanging out with those people? And Jesus called, because I love them. And so the religious leaders, um, they didn't like Jesus. And one of the reasons they did not like him is because he always made everything simple and easy to understand. And the religious leaders of the day, one of the ways they made a living was to make things as complicated as possible, like, like to confuse people. Um, so they would confuse people, and, and Jesus showed up, and he's making everything simple and easy to understand, and they didn't like it. So they were always trying to trick Jesus. Now, I'm, I'm not sure. Like, we look back on that, and we go, that's stupid. It's like, Jesus, how many fingers do I have behind my back? And he's like, I made your fingers, bro. And so, like, that's weird. But back in the day, they thought that was normal to try to trick Jesus. And so they came up to him one time, and this is stories in a lot of the Gospels, but we're focusing on the Gospel of Mark, and they were trying to, trying to trap him with this question, and they asked him this question, what's the most important commandment? Now, that's a legit question, but it's also a question to try to trap him because there were like 618 laws that they were all trying to live by. And so I'm a, I'm a bottom line guy. I want to know what the bottom line is. And Jesus, um, Jesus went straight to the, to the matter. In fact, Mark chapter 12 Verse 30, we're going to use this verse throughout this whole series. In fact, I hope that you'll memorize this verse. It's not a very long verse to memorize. Jesus said this um, in Mark chapter 12, verse 30. Love the Lord your God. When they ask him what the most important commandment is, he said, love the Lord your God with all. Now, listen, if you have a Bible open and you have a pen, I would just encourage you to underline or circle every time you see the word all. Now, I've had some people go, I can't write in my Bible. Listen. It's a tree held together by a cow. It's fine. You'll get that later. It's fine to underline and circle things in your Bible, okay? Uh, Love the Lord your God with all. Notice the word all, not some, not part. All your heart and with all. Y'all are catching on here at the Anderson campus. They're saying it. I'm sure um, they're saying it on other campuses too. With all your soul. That's kind of interesting. And with all. It's getting louder. With all your mind and with all your strength. Jesus, make no mistake about it. Listen to me. Jesus didn't ask for something from you. He asked for everything. Jesus said, I don't want statements from you. Because anybody can say I'm a follower of Jesus. Jesus said, I want surrender from you. I want everything in your life. Hey, listen, the most important commandment, go all in. Put all the chips on the table and be a fully devoted follower of Jesus. Now listen, we can't do that without a plan. Because everybody would go, oh, I have the desire to do that. But as we talk about it over the next several weeks, it actually takes discipline to pull the desire off. And so this week we're going to talk about heart. Next week we're going to talk about mind. The week after we're going to talk about strength. And the final two weeks we're going to talk about soul. And I'm telling you, we're going to see people meet Christ. There are going to be people to meet Christ today. There, you might be here and you're like, well, I've been coming to New Spring. I'm not a Christian. Hey, you keep coming around here long enough, you will be. You will be. Jesus just has a habit of doing stuff like that. So anyway, today I want to talk to you about heart. Today, we're going we're gonna to unpack what does it love, what does it mean to love the Lord your God with all your heart. And here's why we're going to talk about heart. Because when it comes to following Jesus, heart really is the hardest part. And here's why. Our heart and our money go hand in hand. See, right there, I'm already, everybody's it's, it's tense in here. Okay, it's a new year. The church is in financial trouble. I want to call a timeout real quick and say, number one, whenever you make a money sermon about the church, you lose. This church is not in financial trouble. Our giving was up 37.5% last year. We're not hurting. 
Just so you'll know, we are not hurting. In the worst recession this country has ever had, giving for the past four years has increased 27%, then 21%, then 27%, then 37.5%. This is not about this church hurting. This church's bills have been paid. The staff, have been, we, listen, we're not having to lay anybody off. We're not having to go, okay, we're going to have to unscrew every other light bulb and stuff and your kids. We can't give them goldfish anymore, so they're all starving. Like, like, like none of that's going on. Like, I know, I know, I know, I know. It's, but money, Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, and money and heart go like this. Now, some people go, I don't see how they go together. Give it time. That's the same, people, that's the same thing people said when Lucretia and I started dating. I don't see that going together. <laughs> how the heck is and I, I, get, I get that, because Lucretia, she's like, she's like it, guys, you know how you have certain levels of hotness? Like, she's, I think I could date that hot. And then I couldn't touch that hot. She was like, I couldn't touch that hot, but I pursued her for a really long time. I wore her down. That's what I did. And, um, <laughs> but I wasn't weird about it. We'll talk about that later on in the year. But I wore her down. And, and, and when we started dating, like literally, she, Lucretia is valedictorian of high school and college. She's beautiful. She's intelligent. And then there's me. And I'm like, <laughs> but you know that's true, right? That's why some of you come here. You can connect with a pastor a little bit better. <laughs> but give it time. Because people are like, people are like, I don't see y'all together. And I'm like, give it time. Because we've got peas and carrots. And anyway, so we, <laughs> we made it. So, so if you'll give it time, if you'll just give this sermon time, okay? So just kind of let me unpack three main ideas about finances. And listen. You don't even have to be a Christian or believe the Bible, and you're going to have to at least concede point number one. I don't believe this stuff. You will, you've got to concede point number one. And, and by the way, all three are true. So I'm going to unpack three statements about money today because it has to do with our heart, and this is the hardest part. And it's going to get incredibly personal, but it's going to be incredibly fun. Okay? Here we go. Three statements I want to make about this. Three statements I want to make about having loving Jesus with all our heart. Number one, if I am financially connected, I will be emotionally connected. Now, that's just true. That's just true. You don't even have to believe the Bible, but I'm going to show you where Jesus said this in a little while. If I'm financially connected to something, I will be emotionally connected to it. It is impossible to be financially connected to something and not be emotional about what we're financially connected to. Let me unpack this for you. Um, when Lucretia and I first got uh, married, we had to go register. Now, registering for gifts was fun because they give you that little gun, you go around, you shoot things. That's awesome because we're in the South, we love to shoot things. And so I was shooting stuff, but, but um, we had to go register for dishes. Now, I don't listen to me. Before Lucretia, I did not care about dishes. I had a set of dishes from Walmart that cost like $8. And I didn't even use them because I used paper plates recyclable paper plates, okay? You got to say that because the greenies will email. So I, I use the recyclable paper plates. And, and listen, I, I just didn't care. I, listen, if you come to my house for dinner, I don't care. I want, that paper plates are awesome, right? Men, amen. But women, some women, not all women, most women care about the dishes, it's the presentation. And so we had to register for every day where and then get it out once a year, China, which I, I call it, why do you have it, China? But we had to register for both. Now, we registered for both, but here's the deal. When we got married, we were broke. Broke. And so were all our friends. We all had to go to Kentucky Fried Chicken and lick other people's fingers. That's how broke we were, okay? <laughs> so we were broke. And so nobody bought us dishes. Now, Lucretia did pick the most expensive dishes on the planet. Some of you, you've got that wife like I have. She can walk in, there will be three dishes that look exactly the same. Your wife picks the most expensive dish every time. How many of you married that woman? Don't be afraid to raise your hand. Don't be, okay. And I'll tell that to Lucretia, and she looks at me every time I say that, and she goes, I picked you, didn't I? Said, Dang straight woman, you didn't. <laughs> anyway, so, woo, I love my wife. Anyway, so, so she, she picks the most, so, so nobody could buy us our dishes. And so we didn't have dishes. And, and so we got in a money argument one time. And if you're married, you've been in a money argument. If you haven't been in a money argument, you got married yesterday. I don't know what the heck you're doing here today. You should be on your honeymoon. But anyway, you, you got married. Every married couple has had a money argument. And so we got in a money argument one time because I wanted a motorcycle and she wanted dishes. So we compromised and I told her we'd buy some dishes. But I told her that we would buy, 
smart man. I told her we would buy the dishes when we could afford the dishes because I didn't care about the dishes. So long story short, I went on, I went on a speaking thing. A church asked me to come and speak. They gave me an unbelievable honorarium. I'd never been paid like that before. I was like, oh my gosh, I didn't know you made this kind of money for speaking. And so we went to the mall afterwards and I told Lucretia, I showed her the check. Mistake number one, showed her the check. We went to the mall. We're walking around. She walks in this one little shop. She comes out because her dishes had been discontinued. Like, and I was like, motorcycle, baby? She comes out. She's like, um, I found all of our dishes. They're on sale. How many of you have ever had the on sale conversation? You save so much money on. So anyway, they're on sale. And she comes back out. And long story short, we bought the dishes. Now, you know what? I'm just going to be honest with you. In my house, straight up, I care about the dishes now. I care. I can't believe I care about dishes. You know why I care about dishes? I'm financially connected to I know how much those freaking dishes cost. That's why <laughs> I care about the dishes. If you're connected to something emotional, if you're connected to something financially, you're connected to it emotionally, aren't you? Like how many of you have ever gotten mad at someone because you loaned them money and they don't come around anymore? We call these family members here in the South, right? <laughs> you want to get rid of a friend? Loan them money. Loan them money. And you get emotional about it, don't you? There are couples, listen, there are married couples that have had knockdown, drag out arguments over Money, because it's impossible to not be emotional about money. Some of us in this room, we freak out if there's a scratch on our car. You know why? Because we're financially connected to that car. Some people in this room, we freak out when our favorite football team loses. You know why? Because we're a member of the booster club and we pay them money to win, right? We are financially connected to certain things. And when you're financially connected to it, you, when you're financially, you will be emotionally connected. Now, here's what's fascinating. Jesus said this. Jesus said this. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 21, this is, this is Jesus. He said this. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. In other words, this is what Jesus said. Don't miss this. If you're connected to something financially, you will be emotional about it. Now, I just want to ask you a question because I know some people that literally have told me, I've hit a roadblock in my walk with God. There's something holding me back. I don't know what it is. And one of the questions I always go to when I'm having personal conversations one-on-one -on -one is, tell me about your giving. Well, I don't think that's any of your business. Well, I mean, maybe, maybe not, but you did, you did bring it up. And I would simply ask, because Jesus said, if you're not, Jesus said, you're not going to be emotionally connected to me until your heart belongs to me, and your heart doesn't belong to me until your money belongs to me. Maybe the reason some people here today on all of our campuses are not fully connected with God is because your finances are not fully surrendered to him. And here's what I know. You show me the area of your life that is most out of control, and I'll show you the area of your life that God does not control. Now, that's true. That is true. Jesus said, and, and I've, had, I've had men, usually it's men, it's not the women, tell me. Well, here's the deal, Perry. I will give my money to Jesus as soon as he moves my heart. And I would simply say, sir, if a bloodstained cross that paid for your sin and an empty tomb that gives you victory over sin does not move your heart, your heart will never be moved. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, half the people are clapping. If you go, Listen, listen, no, no, don't, don't, don't clap because half the people, you aren't clapping. You know why? I think we might have hit a chord because it's impossible to not be emotional about money, isn't it? In fact, I would say this. The reason some people get so upset is, well, I'll, I'll get to that next. I'll get to that next. I'll get to that next. Listen, if I'm financially connected to something, I will be emotional about it. Period. Point number two. My money declares my master. My money declares my master. Your money, my money, declares who our master is. It's just a fact. Um, I, did, I put a thing out on Twitter yesterday. It was really interesting. Um, what are some things that Southerners say that nobody f understands? And I got all kinds of stuff. A lot of Jeff Foxworthy requotes, but I, I get that. I like Jeff Foxworthy too. Um, but we say some stuff in the South that is impossible to understand, and from time to time, it needs to be unpacked for certain people. One of the phrases that we say in the South that we do not mean is, y'all come go with us. Now, let me explain, y'all come go with us. Y'all come go with us is basically an invitation for everybody in the room to come go with us because we are now leaving. That's what it means. Y'all come go with us. 
We've all said, y'all come go with us. What y'all come, what y'all come go with us really means is, I don't like hanging out with you people anymore. I don't like you. I don't want to be in this room. But I need to say something that makes you feel better about you. But I want to get out of here as soon as possible. So when you want to leave the room because you're freaked out by everybody in the room, you simply stand up and go, y'all come go with us. It doesn't mean y'all come go with us. It means I'm leaving as fast as possible. We say in the South, bless your heart. Bless your heart does not mean bless your heart. Bless your heart means you're stupid. Right? Am I right? Oh, you wore that shirt with those pants. Bless your heart. <laughs> oh, you're dating him. Bless your heart. Like, like we say bless your heart. That's what people say. Oh, people said to Lucretia, oh, you're with him. Bless your heart. Like, I, I get that. I totally get that. We say things in the South that we don't mean. Like, we all say that, right? Well, here's the deal. I want for you as a follower of Jesus to say you're fully bought into Jesus and mean it. I don't want people in this church to be stepping up and going, I'm completely committed to God, but not mean it. And this is what Jesus said. Now, Jesus said this. Jesus said this. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6, verse 24, just a few verses after verse 21, no one, and in the Greek, no one means no one, can serve two masters. Now, let me use a football analogy here because we'll all connect with this, right? If you're a Clemson football fan, you can't serve two masters, meaning you love Clemson and you hate South Carolina and your favorite teams on Saturday are Clemson and whoever's playing South Carolina. Now, there are some people on every campus that'll go, well, I kind of pull for both teams, but when they play each other, I pull for Clemson. You're not a true fan. You're a sellout. You need to burn all your orange stuff today. You've got to hate South Carolina. South Carolina, same thing's true. If you're a Gamecock fan, you love South Carolina, and you can't stand Clemson. You can't stand the color orange. You spanked your child because they came home with an orange shirt from school. Like, you can't stand orange. You can't say, no, I pull for Clemson. You're not a fan. You're not a fan. Like, I can't. Like, I've tried to pull for Carolina before. I can't. I can't. Jesus won't let me. <laughs> so bring it back to Jesus here. He said, no one can serve two masters. No one. Then he said this, either he will hate. Now, hate's a strong word. I've been rebuked by my four-year-old daughter. Daddy, don't say hate. Oh, Jesus said hate. Either he will hate the one and be devoted to the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. And then he said this, you cannot. This is Jesus now. He said, you cannot serve God and money. Now, I would have picked that. I would have said, you can't serve both God and the devil. Like, that would make sense, right? God or the devil. I'm going with God. You know, nobody goes with it. Like, like, but Jesus said, don't miss this. Don't miss this. And I want every person to hear me, and I want you to hear my heart on this because I don't want anything from you. Jesus said the number one competitor for your heart is money. And I've been in ministry for 20 years, and I've been in ministry long enough to tell you that's true. One of the things that gets said to me um, so many times, man, I forgot to say this the last service, but one of the things that gets said to me that just drives me up the wall and it gets said to our staff from time to time is, well, Perry, you're, you're, in, you're in ministry. You don't understand the real world. And simply, I've just started asking people, how many babies' funerals have you preached? How many couples that are about to get a divorce because somebody had an affair have you sat in front of? How many addicts have you prayed with and they go and they do it again? Me and my staff know more about the real world than most people ever sniff. And I'm telling you, the number one thing that rips people apart and rips families apart is people falling in love with money more than Jesus. I don't need a lecture about the real world. I've seen enough of it. The Bible says the love of money is the root of all evil. And Jesus said it is a spiritual, listen to me, impossibility to say you're surrendered to me and your finances not be surrendered to me. Jesus said that. So here's, 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 here's what I want. I want you to understand it. Listen, surrendering your finances to God is completely scary. 
That's why, once again, this church wants nothing from you. We want something for you because I'm telling you, there's some freedom in not living paycheck to paycheck. On every campus, at the bottom of your bulletin, it says www.newspring.cc slash all in. That is a website that you can go to after every message in this series. On that website, there is, a, there is a link, and you can do this at guest services on every campus today. There is a link where you can go and register, listen to me, for a free budgeting class taught by one of our staff members. When I say it's free, it's free. Like, you're not going to show up, or we're going to try to sell you a Pastor P. Bobblehead doll for, 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 for next Christmas, okay? We don't even have those. That would freaking be weird. Like, like, we, we don't, like it's free. If, if you, I don't have child care. We'll pay for the child care. If you'll show up at one of our classes, we will teach you how to budget. Because in America, we don't have an income problem. We have an outflow problem. Agreed? And so, so we will, listen, as a church, there are no strings attached. We would love to teach you how to have a budget and how to live in freedom, how to get out of debt, and how to do what God's called you to do. Because here's what I believe. If you'll get out of debt, you're more free to do what God's called you to do when he calls you to do it. We'll show you how to do this. For free, all you got to do, listen to me, is sign up and show up. Okay? Because at the end of the day, I don't want us running around saying Jesus is Lord if he isn't Lord of everything. Last but not least, God's not trying to take something from me, but rather pour out something on me. I love this. God's not trying to take something from me, but rather pour out something on me on me. I just had Def Leppard pour some sugar on me, pop in my mind for some reason. I'm totally sorry. That just, I know it's an ungodly song. But it is awesome. It, anyway, so here we go. Okay, all of us have fears in life, correct? We have fears. Like um, my fear, snakes, spiders, fears. We, you have fears. Clowns. Clowns are weird. Anybody that dresses like a clown should be feared. Clowns after midnight are especially freaky. Fears. We all have fears. But a lot of us have irrational fears, correct? Like some of us have fears and then some of us have fears. Like if you're a mom of a teenager and they're one minute past curfew, you are like, they've been abducted by aliens. They're on another planet. Like, that, that, like you're that mom, okay? It's, I'll probably be that dad, so I'm with you. So we all have irrational fears. Now I was thinking about it when I was preparing this message. My first irrational fear ever came from when I watched Sesame Street growing up. Anybody watch Sesame Street when you're growing up? Yeah. Now, now listen, I love, I love Sesame Street. I love, I love, I love Bert and Ernie, okay? Hey, Bert. Like, I love Bert and Ernie. I love Cookie Monster. I love Grover. Near. Four. Like, I love that whole thing, okay? <laughs> Loved it. I got to be straight up, though. As a four-year-old kid watching Sesame Street, Mr. Snuffleupagus freaked me out. I had no love for him. Like, every time he came on the screen, I lost my dang mind. I'm like, ah! Because, it's a, listen, it's a mammoth talking to a bird. That's just weird. I don't care how you boil that down. And so I, I freaked out. Now, one night, one of my first memories ever uh, as a kid is we lived in California at the time. I dreamed I was laying in my bed as a four-year-old child, and Mr. Snuffleupagus was coming up my driveway, and he was going, I'm going to eat you. Okay? And... <laughs> So imagine a four-year-old kid running around the house in his underwear screaming, no, because I thought Mr. Snuffleupagus was coming. And I remember my mom and dad telling me, Perry, that's not going to happen. He's not real. But to me, that fear was very real. I'm fine. I got past it last year. So bring that back in to, to us. Many people here today, listen, you're not a Christian, and the reason you're not a Christian is because you're so scared that if you surrender your life to Christ, that God's going to screw it up, when reality is most of us screwed our life up really well without any help from God at all. Come on now, anybody have any, God, I need you to help me screw my life up. Like, that never happened. God doesn't want to, listen, if you're not here today and you don't know Christ, God doesn't want to take anything from you. He wants to pour something out on you. But the same thing is true with money. When, when it comes to money, we're like, oh my gosh, I can't surrender my money to God. The church is after my money. God's after my money. The government's after my money. Everybody's after my money. Let me tell you something. God's not after your money. He's after your heart. But he does not have your heart until he has your wallet. Let me show you this. Let me show you this. This is so cool. I love the Bible. And listen, we believe the whole Bible here. I don't want you to be a Christian that believes the, the verses about heaven, but not the verses about money. Now stay with me. This is what the Bible says. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 9. Honor the Lord with all your wealth. Okay, hold on, because that's where we lose people. I go, well, I'm not wealthy. 
I, I, like, I don't know where you stand on the whole Occupy Wall Street movement. Personally, listen to me. I don't care. Let me tell you what the whole movement was fueled by. Are you listening? This isn't a political statement. This is a biblical statement. It was fueled by greed. You know why? Because those people complain about the 1%, not understanding if you make $33,000 or more, you're in the top 1% of wage earners in the world. So while they're, they're really in the top 1%, they're not concerned about distribution of wealth. They're concerned about getting their own. Make no mistake about it. We are way more wealthy than we could ever imagine. Last year in America, we spent $41 billion on our pets. Billion. It's not wrong to have a dog. It's wrong to have a king and make it a dog. You know what I'm saying? It's 41 billion. Did you know on Black Friday, or I'm sorry, the, 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 like Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, after Thanksgiving this year, we spent $52 million. Or, I'm sorry, $52 billion. $52 billion. To break that down, that's $9 million a minute. We're wealthy. How many of you have ever gone to Starbucks or Dunkin' Donuts or a local coffee shop and paid more than $2 for a drink? Raise your hand. Come on. Raise your hand. Own it. Own it. Own it. Oh, it was the gift card. <laughs> How many of you have more than five pair of shoes? Raise your hand. Women. 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 Come on. 10, 20, 30. Okay, anyway. Now here's what's crazy. You raised your hand saying you have more than five pair of shoes. Most of our congregation here in Anderson, as I'm sure our other campuses did. Isn't it funny that for Christmas this year, we went to local elementary schools and gave kids a pair of shoes because people in our own community didn't have what we've got over five pairs of? See, we say we're not wealthy because we're comparing ourselves to Bill Gates. But the Bible says we're wealthy. Honor the Lord with your wealth. And then he says this, with the first fruits, not the leftover fruits, not the if I feel like it fruits, the first fruits of all your crops. That means all we have. Now look at the promise. Because God's like, I'm not trying to get something from you. I'm trying to pour something out on you. He said, then your barns might be filled. That's not what it says. It says, will be filled to overflowing. And your vats will brim over with new wine. God says, I will pour out blessing on you. One more verse and then I'm done. Of course, it'll take 45 minutes to read this verse. Because you know me, I can't just read. i got a comment. Here we go. Will a man rob God? Malachi chapter 3, verse 8. Will a man rob God? Now, real quick, how many of you in this room here today have been robbed before? Would you raise your hand? You've been robbed. Whoa. We live in a violent section. Like, I know everybody in Columbia had their hand raised. Like, everybody, <laughs> like our campus pastors probably robbed somebody down there. I know Alden. He probably shanked somebody on the way in this morning. <laughs> yeah, it's, I've been robbed, and I've told the story before, but it was scary. I mean, I told y'all, this guy came into Ryan's, I was working at the cash register, he reached in his jacket pocket, he pulled out a knife, the knife kept getting longer, it looked like a sword by the time he was done. <laughs> My name is Eagle Montoya. Anyway, so, they, like, that's, we went there, sorry. Mug pulled out a knife, so give me the money, I had the cash register open up, people were like, you didn't fight him? No, wasn't my money. Care? <laughs> Ryan's, they just cook another steak or something, people. I mean, shoot, Mega Bar needs to get more Mega. Now, if he had wanted your money, would you have fought him? No, I would have given him my money. Now, if he had asked for my wallet, would have fought. Because my license is in my wallet. And I would rather walk through hell on Sunday than go to the DMV and have to get a new license. You know what I'm saying? You don't believe in hell? Go to the DMV. You will believe in hell. Hell is real. God has given us. Anyway, so... I didn't like being robbed. Did you like being robbed? Nobody likes being robbed. Nobody woke up. Goals for the year, get robbed. Like nobody wrote that down. Well, the man says, will a man rob God? The Bible says, will a man rob God? Yet you rob me. Whoa, 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 God. How are we robbing you? But you ask how we rob you. In tithes and offerings. So God expects both. Now watch this, verse 9. You are under a curse. Hold on. How many of y'all have been cussed out? Don't raise your hand. People raise their hand anyway. Because it, it, it just happened, didn't it? Like at family Christmas. Like in the South, you don't have a good family Christmas until grandma gets drunk and cusses somebody out. Like somebody is getting cussed out up in the South. You know what I'm saying? 
You get cussed out. And listen, listen, getting cussed out doesn't bother me. I've been cussed out before. You cuss me out, I'm going to go home, eat a quesadilla, take a nap. I'm good, okay? <laughs> but I just don't want God to curse me. Once again, nobody wrote down, goals for the year, get cursed by God. Like that, that if that's on your list, dang, I'm, I'm just, ugh. But God says you are under a curse, the whole nation of you, because you are robbing me. Whoa, 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 how do we end the curse? Listen, the reality is this today. Your finances are either blessed or cursed by God, and you're the one that makes the choice. Malachi 3.10. Bring the whole tithe. Now, let me explain that because in the Christian, we just, I had a guy ask me one time, what is tithing? Huh? What is tithing? Oh, you need a dentist or something? Like, I, I don't know what that is. Like, t- t- tithing. Oh, tithing. Oh, tithing. Tithing. Tithing is 10% off the gross. 10% off the gross. So, 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 so stay with me. I, I'm not good at math. I think Satan created math, okay, and cats. I think Satan created math. Okay, because the Bible says God is not the author of confusion. If God is not the author of confusion, who is the author of confusion? Satan is math, not the most confusing thing in the world. So, Satan created math. That's my reasoning, and it works. So, but we can all do this. So, so, so tithing is one out of every ten. So, if you get ten dollars, how many dollars goes to God automatically? Oh, come on. If you get ten dollars, how many dollars goes to God automatically? One. Yes. Okay. Now, if you get $100, how many automatically goes to God? Ten, which is harder because you can't do anything with a dollar. But $10, you can be like, I can get an iTunes gift card with $10. I mean, I can go to Chipotle for $10. I mean, I can, I can, I can do some stuff with $10. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Now, if you get $1,000, how many goes to God? That's freaking hard, isn't it? Because you can do something with $100. Yeah, I can't do anything with $100. Bring it to me. I'll show you. I- I'll show you what to do. With I can do something with $100. If you get $10,000, how many goes to God? $1,000. See, that's, mm, I don't know if I could give $1,000. I've had people, well, Perry, I'm in real estate, and I make a lot of money. I'm not sure if I could give God that much money. And I'm like, bro, if God wouldn't have made the real estate, you wouldn't have anything to flip and sell. Hello? Well, I'm, in, I'm a businessman. Hey, God invented commerce, bro. I had a guy tell me, I raised cattle. Where, where do you think cow came from? <laughs> God made the cow. Okay? I, I'm, I'm just telling you, the Bible says, God says, I'm going to bless you with this. Just give me one out of every ten. One out of every ten. One out of every ten. Bring the whole tithe. Look at the rest of that verse. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse. Storehouse is the local church. Now, you can disagree with me, and that's awesome. You have the right to be wrong. (laughs) Listen to me. In the Bible, we're going to talk about the Bible here. And I know there's people that strongly disagree. If you're going to disagree, put on your big boy pants and bring me your Bible, not your opinion. Because the tithe goes to the local church. I've had people say, well, I give 5% to my church, and I give 5% to this over here. Let me, then 5% of what you give is blessed, and 5% of what you give is cursed. And listen, we should support parachurch ministries. I believe in them. We should support great organizations. We, I believe in them, and our church does. But God says 10% goes to the local church. There's not one example anywhere in the scriptures of a gift less than 10% coming to the house of God. Old Testament and New Testament, it always came to the house. And here's why. Because in 500 years, nothing you're giving to today except the local church will still be lasting if Jesus doesn't come back. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse. And this is my favorite part. So that there may be food in my house. You see that? So that there may be food in my house. Now, really quick question on all of our campuses. How many of you got food in your house? You got food in your house right now. You ain't going to go eat any of it. You're going to go out to lunch. But you got food or dinner. You're going to go food. You got food in the house. I love food in the house. I got up the other day. I took a nap. Why is it that when you take a nap, you wake up hungry? No matter what you ate before the nap, you're going to take a nap. You're going to wake up hungry. I woke up hungry. And you know what? I walked in my kitchen. There was food in the house. And I was celebrating because there was food in the house. I walked in my kitchen. There were apples. There were bananas. There were oranges. 
And I thought, my family needs to be healthy. So I let them have all that. I went and got the iced animal crackers. You know what I'm saying? I opened up the cover. I'm like, fruit, 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 iced animal crackers. Like, yes, God, I see that. I, 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 there was food in the house. I was celebrating because there was food in the house. Now, let me tell you why I get so excited about this. New Spring Church, when you showed up here today, there's food in the house. There's been food in this house for years. You know why? Because we got generous people in this church. We have generous people. And if you're a giver in this church, you've stepped up and you've given over the past year, five years, 10 years. I want to thank you. I want to show you right now the fruit of your giving. I want you to see it with your own eyes. I want you to see this. On every campus, if you have re either received Christ at New Spring Church or you have been baptized at New Spring Church, I want you to hold your hand up right now and leave it up. Hold your hand up right now and leave it up. Hold your hand up right now and leave it up and look around. Hey, listen, when they showed up, there was food in the house, right? There was food in the house. When we showed up, there was food in the house. And when there's food in the house, people have something to eat. They didn't show up to a church that has empty cupboards. They showed up to a church that has food in the house. Thank you very much. You know why I get so excited personally about giving to this church? Because there's food in this house. And, and, mm, some of the fruit, we don't get to see it immediately. We're going to get to see it years down the road. Hey, parents, those of you that have a kid in Kids Spring right now, you know why I'm so pumped up about giving to this church? Because the kids are going to Kids Spring, and you know what is going on back at Kids Spring? There's food in the house. There is food in the house at Kids Spring. And some of our children, listen to me, some of our children aren't growing up hating church like we did. What, parents, listen to me, what would have happened if you and I would have had an environment like Kids Spring to grow up in? Those kids are going to grow up in an environment that we didn't have the opportunity. And maybe, just maybe, they don't walk away from Jesus when they get in high school. And maybe they don't walk into the busted up marriages that some of us walked into. And maybe they don't make some of the mistakes that, that keep us up at night. And you know why? Because when they showed up at Kids Spring today, there was food in the house because we have a generous church that gives. I praise God for our, yeah, praise God for that. See, there's no way, there's no way to measure this. What about our Fuse student ministry? Listen, did you know that we have one of the largest youth ministries in the United States of America? Did you know that? See, some people don't know it, but you know why they're showing up? Because there's food in the house. When our kids show up to Fuse on Tuesday night and Wednesday night on every campus, you know why they're showing up? Because there's food in the house. We've got small group leaders. We've got staff. We've got resources. And listen, listen, parents, once again, I, get, I can't even come to Fuse sometimes. Every time I hang out with the teenagers, I just weep. You know why? I just think, if I would have had that in high school, if I would have had that in middle school, maybe I don't make some of the mistakes I made. And you know what, parents? Some of you, because of our Fuse ministry, you're never going to have to know what it's like to have a pregnant teenage daughter. You're never going to know how, what it's like to have a son that gets addicted to drugs. You're not going to know what it's like to have a prodigal. You know why? Because our Fuse ministry teaches these kids how to love Jesus. There is food in the house because we have generous people up in this church that invest in teenagers and we believe in them. And we believe, listen, listen. I'm not going to be the pastor of the church full of old people that sit around going, where'd all the young people go? There's food in this house. The young people are going to come. Where there's, listen, teenagers show up where there's food in the kitchen. Amen? Hey, there's no way to measure it. How many marriages have been saved because there's food in the house? How many addicts have been set free because there's food in the house? How many people have walked away from busted up lives because there's food in the house? How many people have met and married the person that God has for them up in this church because you met them in here because there's food in the house? You can't put a price tag on food in the house. And we have food in the house because we have generous Christians in this church. Listen, the, listen, the reason the kingdom of darkness it's so prevalent in the world and because the devil's so big it's because Christians sometimes are so greedy and I've done this before at Anderson campus but I want all of our other campuses to see it maybe you've never seen this at Anderson campus but God doesn't want anything from you he wants something for you because the Bible says this in Malachi 310 let's read the rest of this verse together he said test me in this this is God saying test me in this says the Lord Almighty. In other words, he's like, are you looking at me? Did you rub my lamp? Did you bring me here? Do you understand who you're talking to right now? I am the Lord Almighty. I am Almighty God. I can do anything. 
I ain't worried about your checkbook. I'm worried about your heart. He said, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that you will not have room enough for it. That is the promise of God. So we're going to break it down like this. I can teach better when I use food. You got two people. Mr. and Mrs. Skittle. These are Skittles. You got this person that's, you're freaked out about your finances. Listen, I understand. And Perry, you don't understand. My, I get my paycheck and then there's the, there's the house payment. We got a swim pool. And there's the car payment. I got a big car, I love my car. And then my kid went to college. <laughs> Private school. <laughs> Then I, I got my hobbies and, you know, I got my, I got my big screen TV and I got all my stuff up here. I just don't have enough left. This is my life. I'm freaked out. I'm empty. Hey, I get it. I've been there. Got the t-shirt. This person right here is like, you know what? I don't understand it. It don't make sense. But I'm just going to put God first. Every month, I'm just going to put him first. God, you're first. You're, you're first. 10% to the height. You are first. God, I'm putting you first. I'm putting you first. I ain't holding back. Well, then, you know, it, the payments still come. You got your house payment. You got your car payment. You got your private college kid payment, you know. You got, you got all kinds of stuff. You got your hobbies. You got your TV. And, 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 and you get to the, you get, and it starts looking empty. But God says, test me in this. Put me first. Because you can't outgive me. And if you'll do this, he said, I will pour out so much blessing on you. I love the fact that God didn't say, I would fill your cup. God said, I will pour out so much blessing on you that you will not have room enough for it. Our God says, my bucket is bigger than your bucket and you can't even handle the blessing I wanna pour out on your life. That's the kind of God we have. God don't want anything from you. He wants something for you. He wants something for, he wants for you to be blessed, not cursed. That choice now is up to you. Where are you going to be this year? 2012, is this the year you surrender your heart? Because the heart is the hardest part. Let's pray. My head's bowed and eyes closed on every campus. I just want to ask you, is this area of your life surrendered to Jesus? And if not, listen. I'm not going to ask you to fill out a card. I'm not going to ask you to walk forward. We're not going to ask you to take a, I mean, I'm not going to do any of that. Here's all I'm going to say. You do business right there with the Lord. Because if it's not right, you need to make it right today. And some of you, this message was not about tithing at all. It was about Jesus. Jesus died on the cross to pay for your sins and you have not surrendered your life to him and here's why. You're so scared if you surrender your life to him, he's gonna screw it up or take something from you. But that Skittles illustration, listen, he don't wanna take something from you. He wants to pour out meaning and purpose into your life. He wants to give you the promise of heaven. He wants to give you the hope of his presence every day of your life. And all you gotta do, the Bible says, is Romans 10, 9, is, is, is confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead and you will be saved. So if that's you on all of our campuses today, if you're here today and you're like, hey, that, money, that message was about money, but for me it was about Jesus, I want you, and let people have done this in other services today, I want you right now, because you've been, you, listen, you've been running for long enough to give your life to Jesus. You say, Perry, how do I do that? You simply confess him as Lord and tell him you believe in him and you want him to come into your life. If you, listen, I'm not asking you to pray a prayer, I'm asking you if you want to do that, if you want to nail it down today, January 8, 2012, make Jesus Lord of your life. You just pray right where you are and you say, Jesus Christ, I confess that you are Lord. I need you in my life. Thank you for dying on the cross to pay for my sins. Right now I receive that payment. Come into my life and take over. I surrender to you. Show me how to live for you, Jesus the rest of my life, the best I know how. In Jesus' name I pray. All God's people said, amen. Hey, listen, on every campus, keep your seat because here's what I want you to do if you just prayed to receive Christ. And, and people have done this all day long. If, if you just prayed to receive Christ, in your bulletin, 
there is a little perf thing right here. If you just flip that little thing up right there, and it says, I, today I received Christ at New Spring Church. It says name, email, and phone number. All I want you to do is fill that out right now. You just fill it out right now. And on your way out on every campus in the lobby, there's a connections table. It's the connections table. You'll see it. You can't miss it. We have a gift for you there. We, have, um, we want to get your name, email address, and phone number to help you follow up, take your next step. It's, listen, if you just became a Christian, that's the most important thing you can do. That's your next step. I'm asking you, just fill it out right now. People will see me filling it out. Of course they will. That's awesome. They'll probably get excited about it. If they're mad about it, they'll probably fill one out at this, in this series at some point because they don't know Jesus, okay? Second thing, if you'll notice, I'm standing still because if I move, I will bust my rear end because there are Skittles all over the stage. So I need you to pray that I get off this stage. Number three, listen, I love you. I want you to sign up for the budgeting class. I want you to go to all in, uh, newspring.cc slash all in. If there's any way we can serve you, if you need to get more disciplined to giving, there's online giving. There's all kinds of tools and resources there for you. We want to help you. And listen, next week, next week, we're going to talk about how to love Jesus with all our minds. The title of the message is, Have You Lost Your Mind? I cannot wait. I love you. God bless. Have a great week. See you next week.